Prior to John Dalton, there were only philosophical ideas that were created by ancient Greek philosophers. John Dalton in the early 1800s began to create what it was known as atomic theory and he did it on based on a number of different experiments and here were here are the points or the major points or information that came that were a result or of his discoveries first of all he based his theory on the law of conservation of mass and law of constant composition which were already laws at the time which basically said that mass or matter could not be created nor destroyed but only conserved would be conserved and merely transformed um, and then the law of constant composition. Now, some things that he did discover are true and hold true today. Atoms are the smallest form of matter. Now, later on, other models and scientists would come to discover that there are actually particles within atoms, but Dalton did not know that. So atoms are the smallest form of matter. Atoms are individual spheres, different for each element, which is still true. Each element um, has an atom that is unique um, and different from the others. Atoms of each element are identical in mass and properties, which we will see that this actually did not end up, did not stand and hold true. That actually got um, something, one of his points from his theory or one of his conclusions from his theory did actually um, uh, did not uh, uh, stand true to today. Um, atoms do combine, rearrange, and separate to form different substances. This is, he was basically upholding what is known as just a modern and, at the time, just a chemical reaction. Okay, so this is true. Compounds are composed in different proportions of elements, which is true. Water has two hydrogens for every one oxygen. Carbon dioxide has one carbon for every two oxygens. So, compounds are composed in definite proportions of certain elements. So this is a one to two ratio of carbon to oxygen. This is two hydrogens for one oxygen. So this held true, okay? So this was uh, what it was known as Dalton's atomic theory. And then the model that he developed looks like just a sphere. So Dalton's sphere or billiard ball model basically looked just like a three-dimensional circle. He did not know anything about protons, neutrons, or electrons. No nucleus. None of that was known at the time. And so you can see this is where he basically showed that um, that atoms can come together, rearrange, or create this uh, new uh, matter that was composed of multiple atoms. Now, what were his shortcomings? What is it that um, he was not able to determine based on his experimentation in the early 1800s? Well, first of all, Science and technology really wasn't on his side. It was going to be another 90, almost 100 years down the road before another scientist came along to improve his theory. Atoms, first of all, are divisible into smaller subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons, okay? He didn't know anything about this. He thought atoms were just solid spheres. So that was a shortcoming or something he was not able to determine. Also, atoms of the same element can have different masses. This is what we've been talking about recently, is isotopes. So, for example, the atom carbon can have a mass of 12, it can have a mass of 13, or it can have a mass of carbon 14, okay? And, that's, and we will later determine uh, that that was based on a difference in neutron count. So, those were his shortcomings. Now, the next scientist that came along was J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson... Um, and around approximately 1897, when he was doing his studies, discovered the electron using a cathode ray tube. So the electron was the very first subatomic particle to be discovered. Um, negative, he, his model basically determined that these negative charges, um, he knew that the atom was overall, let me step back for a second, he knew that the atom was overall neutral. So he knew that these negatively charged particles that he discovered with the cathode ray tube had to be somehow surrounded by positive charges that would neutralize them. So he just proclaimed that the electrons were like these plums, these negative charged particles that were spread throughout a positive pudding. And so he named his model uh, after a famous Danish dessert at the time called plum pudding. Now, he was the first scientist, and this is the most important thing about Thompson, to propose that atoms were made up of even smaller particles.
Now, this is uh, just two different uh, illustrations of Thompson's plum pudding model. You can see right here that here's the negatively charged electrons that are basically embedded in what was a uniform positively charged base. So he essentially was thinking that the entire atom was positively charged with negatively charged particles kind of Velcroed in it or maybe just kind of like floating around in it randomly. Same thing here, a spherical cloud of positive charge. Now these were not, now these were not protons, okay? So I know that they're individualized, but this image is basically showing that he thought that this purple backdrop was essentially the pudding or the base that was completely positive. And then these are the electrons he discovered that were randomly scattered throughout that positive base. Now, Thompson's inaccuracies or shortcomings, first of all, the positive charge of an atom is not universally distributed throughout the atom. What Rutherford, the next scientist that actually was, that comes along, was able to actually determine that, these, that the positive charge of an atom was actually enclosed inside a tiny nucleus. Thompson did not know this. He thought that the uh, entire atom was just uniformly positively charged with these little seeds of negative charge known as electrons spread throughout. So, also, he didn't determine where all the mass of an atom is located. Now, Ernest Rutherford in um, approximately 1911, and this was just a, a roundabout you know, time period where he did his Gold foil experiment and created his model and, and proclaimed his discoveries. First of all, the gold, gold foil experiment, which I'll show an image of that in just a moment, was this experiment where he took this gold foil that was essentially just... Um, rotating like um, uh, a little like a little hamster wheel um, and he was uh, shooting alpha particles at the gold uh, foil and the gold atoms um, were kind of the focus of this experimentation because as the alpha particles were and he had this detection screen that was around the experimental area and what he noticed was that every now and again like two out of two thousand um, alpha particles would actually deflect back, would actually hit the detection screen, which meant that they were hitting something inside of the gold foil atoms, or the gold atoms rather. So what he was able to determine with his gold foil experiment is that the atom is mostly empty space. He discovered the nucleus. Very important to realize that Rutherford was responsible for discovering the nucleus. Alpha particles were deflected off a small center, but very dense, meaning that all the mass was in that tiny nucleus at the center of the gold atoms. He proved electrons are indeed orbiting outside of a positive center known as the nucleus, okay? Now, in 1932, later on, James Chadwick, who in his early years began his studies as Rutherford's student, would later discover the neutron, which were also particles within this nucleus that Rutherford discovered, but they had the same, that had the same mass as protons, but no charge. Now, here is just kind of an example of what was going on with the gold foil experiment. Here's what the emitter that was actually uh, shooting or distributing the alpha particles, and here's the gold foil that's basically rotating on a wheel, okay? And what he noticed was, and you cannot see all this in, in here, but about two, you have to imagine that these two, and there were like, the, the ratio was that two out of 2,000 particles roughly were shooting back towards um, the emitter on the other side and not actually going through to the other side of the detection screen. So these right here that are not going straight through also are maybe edging the nucleus a little bit and that's what's causing them to go the other direction. And you can see right here, these are gold foil atoms in this image and it's showing where every now and again, like right here, that the alpha particles would either kind of edge one of the nuclei of a gold foil atom or they it would hit it dead center and deflect completely back. So this is how he was able to discover that because so many of the alpha particles went straight through that the gold, excuse me, that an atom is mostly empty space but there is this small dense center, uh, very, has lots of all the mass of the atom but very tiny at the center known as the nucleus and that's where the positive charge was held. And of course, here's Rutherford's model, or is his atom, where basically you've got electrons that are orbiting around a positively charged nucleus. Now, what were his shortcomings? Well, first of all, Rutherford discovered a lot, so we don't want to just kind of uh, 
act like he didn't do much because he really did. Rutherford was able to discover the nucleus and positive charge being in the center of the atom, but Rutherford did not explain the arrangement of electrons outside the nucleus of an atom. And that's extremely important because the arrangement of electrons and just the behaviors of the electrons in general outside the atom are what ultimately explain chemical bonding and the behavior, chemical behaviors of an atom. He was not aware that electrons have distinct energy states, okay? So, he actually had a student by the name of Niels Bohr. Some say Niles Bohr. I like the way Niels sounds better. But Niels Bohr, approximately in 1913, who was a student of Rutherford's, established that electrons orbit with specific energy levels around the nucleus. Now, Bohr specifically studied the hydrogen atom. He explained the emission line spectra, which we'll look at in just a minute, um, that, that basically the electron, because hydrogen only has one electron, it's got one proton, so it's got one electron in its electron cloud, that this one electron is what he studied, and as you um, excited this uh, electron or this atom of hydrogen, if he excited the hydrogen gas, that the electron would actually bounce back and forth or jump in between energy levels, okay, and would actually go out further and jump to a new energy state and by absorbing energy. And when it would fall back down, it would actually release like red light or blue light or green light, okay? So as it did this, it would release that energy that absorbed back out. So Bohr, by studying the hydrogen atom, was able to establish that electrons have these distinct energies within energy shells. So you can see that in these models right here, and we'll actually be doing in our next chapter, doing a really cool lab where we take a look at emission line spectra um, and these uh, quantum leaps that electrons do. But basically he was showing that a light was being released by the electrons of hydrogen as it goes in and out of these distinct energy shells. So very important stuff. There is what is known as the ground state for an electron versus the excited state, and whenever it leaves that excited state, it releases energy um, of a certain wavelength of color. And so this is what Bohr, how Bohr was able to determine that electrons actually have fixed energy states. Now, after Bohr and his discovery with hydrogen and, and the emission line spectra and the energy shells, modern atomic theory came about, and there were a number of men a host of scientists that uh, led to the latest and greatest and most sophisticated model known as the quantum mechanical model. Approximately in the 1920s and beyond, um, the nature of the electron was explained. Now, Max Planck was able to say that electrons' energy is quantized. Like, so basically, they don't, that electrons, and again, in our next chapter, will really be breaking down this information in greater detail, but just know that Planck was able to say that electrons' energy is quantized, meaning that in order for electrons to actually move in and out of energy states, that they had to have a specific amount of energy to do so. Like if they needed 100 kilojoules of energy to go from one energy shell to the next, they could not have 9900 excuse me 99 kilojoules or 101 kilojoules but exactly 100 kilojoules to make the jump so we'll talk about quantized energy again in our next chapter now louis de broglie was able to say that electrons basically are wave like particles they're not just particles but they can kind of morph in between being a wave of energy and an actual subatomic particle the Heisenberg uncertainty principle so heisenberg basically said and did a few studies with this and made some really good analogies about how you cannot know the elect an electron's location or its position and velocity, its speed at the same time, okay? And so, and it's basically because in trying to measure the position and velocity, you would disturb the energy of the electron somehow. So, Planck, de Broglie, Heisenberg, and then um, Mr. Schrodinger. So this, uh, so Schrodinger was, a, bri a very brilliant man and to understand his equations would make you a genius <laughs> but 
we don't have to know all that in our class. All we need to know is that Schrodinger was the one that came up with these wave equations that established that electrons have pathways known as atomic orbitals, but these orbitals aren't like the planets orbiting the sun where it's like this direct distinct path. These orbitals are actually three dimensional regions that are kind of a fuzzy cloud of only probable locations where electrons can be found, okay? So only the approximate location of electron can be known in a complex region, which is known as an atomic orbital with distinct energy. So the atomic orbital has a distinct known energy, but the actual and exact location of an electron within that orbital cannot be known with certainty. So the quantum model, also known as the modern electron uh, model, really just ends up looking like a blur of energy surrounding the nucleus where electrons can be found. You've got this region around the nucleus where there, it is the most dense, okay? Um, right here, I'll talk more about this image later, but this right here, when we think about electrons, um, the more realistic thing is like this is an electron like if you were riding on the back of an electron This is what it would look like your view would be like okay um, or theoretically Okay, so here's all five of your models um, You've got notice how they progressively get more advanced right here. There's no sub subatomic particles in the Dalton model Then we start seeing the electrons in Thompson's plum pudding model This is what he was able to discover was electrons Rutherford discovers that there is a new a positively charged nucleus so he discovers that they are positive charges in a nucleus and that the electrons are actually orbiting outside of it Bohr continues to say yes this is a positively charged nucleus negatively charged electrons but they are actually in these distinct energy shells surrounding the nucleus and then there's the quantum mechanical model, which ends up being kind of this cloudy blur. You can see these are the atomic orbitals that surround the nucleus where the electrons are most likely to be found. We will spend our next chapter specifically going over both of these in great detail. But for right now, these are the main key points and conclusions that you guys should have taken from the History of the Atom Project.